darkness runs for cover When you move No one's turned away Where you are Fear turns into praise Where you are No hearts left unchanged So come Move, let justice roll on like a river Let worship turn into revival Lord, lead us back to you When you move, the outcast finds a family When you move orphan finds a home. Here we are, teach us to love mercy. With humble hearts, we bow down at your throne. So come, so come, move, let justice roll. That's our prayer this morning, that you would lead us back to you. God, I pray for generations to come that justice would roll through our culture, that kingdom justice would be the only justice future generations know. God, as we are gathered to worship, we come to sing your name to pray in your name, to give in your name, and to listen to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Welcome to West End Assembly of God's first ever flash worship. Come on. 
It was pretty cool. And you guys all showed up. I just put the word out there, and I can't even believe how many people just showed up at a whim. I can't believe how many people have nothing to do on a Saturday afternoon. It's amazing. Hey, if you're just joining us online, you are joining us Sunday morning at 10 a.m. We are so glad you are here with us online. Hey, comment throughout the rest of this service and uh, put your comments on there, prayer requests, things we want to hear from you. Uh, my name is Shane Schlesman. I'm lead pastor here at West End Assembly of God. It's my honor to pastor some of the greatest people I've ever met in my entire life who gather together on a Saturday afternoon last minute just in case the snow is too much and we can't have church tomorrow. That's pretty cool. You guys are pretty awesome. And plus, I want to dispel a few rumors, okay? I am not canceling church tomorrow so that I can watch the Eagles game. All right? That's not true. That's not true. If you heard that, that's not true. First of all, the Eagles game's at 4 o'clock, so could have done it anyway, all right? Uh, the second rumor I'm dispelling and just gathering this morning really finally lets me deal with this one because it's been out there for a while, I know. You've probably heard it before that Pastor Shane likes to, he really writes his sermons on Saturday nights. Well, it's Saturday afternoon, so we're in trouble if that's true. Uh, but I can tell you that Pastor Shane edits a lot on Saturday night, so you're getting the unedited, uncut version this, uh, this afternoon. So, okay, it might be a little bit raw, but I got something I really want to share with you, and I couldn't wait to do it, and I, I didn't want to, to put it off. I just have this message on my heart. I can't wait to give all of you today. So let's do that. Before we hear from God's word, let's put his name before all of us and let's worship him. Maybe you've come in here, you have a, a prayer need during our worship. There are two prayer stations on either side. You can come and there'll be people right there ready to pray with you and, and lift up your need during. If that's an act of worship for you right now, maybe that's what you need to do. If you're online and watching as you worship, I hope you'll join us. Gather your family in your living room. Uh, take some time out. Pray together. Uh, we're going to do that together as a church. Let's worship him now. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all From beginning to the end It will always be It's always been you, Jesus 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 at the center of it all Jesus at the center of it all From beginning to the end It will always be, it's always been you, Jesus Oh, Jesus, nothing else matters Nothing in this world You're the center Everything revolves around you Oh Jesus, you Jesus be the center of my life Jesus be the center of my life my heart. 
be the center of your church and every knee will bow and every tongue they shall confess you Jesus oh Jesus Jesus Draw me again into the center of your love where I begin. I know that you are still enough, Lord, you like before when I discovered who you are I need you
just make that your attitude of prayer right now. Jesus, we need you more. We need you more than anything and more than ever. Maybe you've come in, you've got a prayer need right now, even with those who are joining us live right now. If you've got something, a burden you're carrying right now, we want to pray for you. Would you just raise your hand right now wherever you're at so we can be the church and pray for you right now? You're coming in here with a burden. You're coming in here. Maybe it's someone else's burden you're carrying for them on their behalf. Raise your hand real high. Those of you around them, would you just put a hand on their shoulder? If you don't have someone near you, we're going to put some names on the screen right now. Let's lift up. Let's be the church and lift up our church body together. Those of you online, you can put your prayer requests right there. Join us in prayer right now. Pray through the needs of our body. Pray for each other. Let's do that. Gather in your living rooms and pray for your families. God, we just give you all of these needs right now. We need you more than ever. We need you, oh God. Lord, I pray that you would just touch each and every person that, are, that is right here. Touch the people who are watching online right now. God, you know their needs. We don't even have to know them. You already knew them before we asked you. But God, we come to you because we know that the process of prayer for us is to come to you. And you, in that process, God, would you replace what is such a heavy burden right now with such a glorious peace that only you can give. God, would you give us a peace that passes all human understanding? God, we lift up the needs of our church, those who are struggling right now, the many people who have cancer, the many people who are grieving, the many people who are ministering right now. Lord, we lift up these needs to you. God, you know exactly what they need, and we pray, oh God, that you would touch them in Jesus' name right now. God, we know that we need you more. As you make your way back to your seats, will you just make that the prayer of your hearts and sing that one more time? I need you more. Make that your prayer. I need you more. I need you more than ever. We need you, oh God. I need you more. Jesus, I need you. Come into this place already. Your presence is so tangible. God, I pray that we would live every hour and every day like this, knowing that we need you. We so often get focused on other things, thinking we know what we need. God, would you make the realization a reality for us that you are truly who we need more. And so we'll depend on you more than we depend on any other answer that could come to our path today. Thank you for this church. Thank you for this time of worship. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. We're so glad you're here with us to worship in this flash worship moment. <laughs> it's just a reminder, isn't it, that just uh, two hours ago, some of you were like, ah, you know, I've got a busy day, but I, I gave you the opportunity and some of you just placed God as a priority. It's like, if I've got a chance to worship, I'm there. If I've got a chance to, to worship, I'm, I'm in. I'm <laughs> in. 
I love that. Thank you for doing that. If you couldn't be with us, uh, we're sorry that you're not here, but we're so glad you're able to join us uh, this morning as we stream this out to everybody. Uh, we want to not just worship God in our song but, and in the Word as we're going to do, but we want to worship in our giving as well. And if, whether you're here live or you're joining us online, I want to tell you a, a special thank you for those of you who gave. Last year's calendar year, every year we just keep hitting new heights and new amazing ability, and we watch what you give, and we're amazed by it year after year after year. This year was no exception, even despite the fact that we had a snow Sunday already in December, and we already missed a week, which, which I don't know if you know anything about church life, but just you don't have to be that smart about it to make sense, okay? You have one less offering, that hurts you, okay? Uh, but we plan and budget our bills, and every single dollar that comes in, based on your giving, based on your generosity, we plan to do a ton of ministry. Do you know we came within $20,000 of our giving budget in 2018, even though we missed Sundays and even though all of that was happening, we came within $20,000. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So uh, what that means is, you know, we've been, we've been hit a little bit on, on the way with uh, tornadoes and other things, uh, those aren't. God knew those were going to happen before we ever knew it. And we're, we're running about $50,000 behind our budget total at, for the whole fiscal year starting in September for us. So everything that you give is a part of partnering with us. And I know you don't give. Those of you who give regularly to West End Assembly of God, you don't give because of what we ag did for you or you give out of obedience to God because whether you love what's going on or you don't, you give because you put him first and seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Amen. Uh, those of you regular givers in here, those of you online, I know you're amen and with me. But you can uh, give many ways. You can give online. You can text to give. Uh, if you're here live uh, and you have the opportunity to give, if you didn't come prepared to do that this morning, uh, we'd love for you to worship sometime this weekend with us and give online and join us in the mission that God has for us at West End Assembly of God to take his word around the world. As I pray and thank God for this offering time, I'm going to invite our ushers forward for to receive our offering and this act of worship for us this morning. Let's pray. God, thank you for this opportunity to worship you this way. Thank you for the opportunity we have to give to you. Lord, we don't give circumstantially because everything's worked out for us. We don't give because of just we have extra to give. We give because you've called us to put you first in everything in our lives. And so right now we do that with our finances. God, we just put it first. And would you take care of all of our needs as we take this act of worship right now? We say, Jesus, you have everything. And I put you first. And Lord, would you use every dollar to forward the mission to reach the world, discipling those in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. As we take up the offering, as that passes you, let's stand and worship and continue to worship his name. Here in this place, we wait long for your presence. We need you and seek you. We are desperate for more of your love. Speak through the noise, quiet our hearts, draw Calling us now to be 
Revive us again, oh God. Not just as a church, but as what a church truly is. Those who are called out, those individuals who are revived, who come together, and as they come together, they represent your revival for the world to not just see, but to experience. So God, I pray that you would do that. For all those who are here, for all of us and those who are watching and who 
whoever watched this to know that you revive us, oh God. So thank you, Jesus. We pray these things in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Would you thank these guys for just leading us this morning? Awesome. Who knew you could have such great impromptu worship? You can be seated. Uh, we're so grateful to be able to come together on a Saturday afternoon. Like I told you, it's going to be a little bit raw, okay? Okay. Uh, I might have had some more edits to go along the way, but I appreciate the opportunity uh, to just share with you what's been on my heart. If you're just joining us, we've been in a series as a church entitled Living Legacy. Uh, This is actually, this year, we will celebrate as a church 50 years in ministry. Isn't that amazing? 50 years of ministry here at West End Assembly of God. Uh, What an incredible story that God is writing through this church. It's an amazing story, and and I'm excited to be a part of celebrating. Our actual anniversary is on March 2nd, and uh, we're going to celebrate that week, that all week long. We've got special things planned for you. Uh, As I mentioned before, if I told you, you wouldn't believe me. And I don't know them all, so I won't tell you all of them, but we are working on it, and uh, I'm telling you, the things that are coming uh, already in place, I'm super excited about. I can't wait to celebrate with you in March, but we didn't want to start and wait all the way to March to start celebrating, okay? So we wanted to start celebrating right away, and so that's what we started in this series uh, for our, the first part of our year, to start off our focus in what is not just focused on the past. And not just focused on the future as well, but focused on what it means to continually be living legacy, thus the name Living Legacy. So I hope you'll go with us today on this journey and and take what is week two. Last week, we talked about staying in your lane. We talked about what it means to run your race, the race that God has set for you, finding out what your lane, and I know that's a funny, popular saying uh, to say, but stay in your lane. That was last week. This week, I want to talk about this, to honor the race before you, to honor the race before you. Now... When I was young and I was on a basketball team and on a soccer team and on different teams, you know, uh, that was, uh, we didn't just have the boys sports, we had the girls sports. And the big thing, the big challenge for the school was to get the people just as excited about the girls sports as it was for the boys varsity. How many know that what what I'm saying is real, okay? Uh, The struggle is real. Uh, But nowadays, it's not. You know, I look at our American teams, okay? Our girls pretty much crush the, the guys, okay? Girls rule, boys drool. I get it, right? It's awesome. Uh, you guys rock. But, but when I was in high school, being as self-centered as I am, I, I can be honest with you and tell you that the race before me, the game before me, wasn't real important to me. So our coach actually had to make us, believe it or not, had to make us go and attend the girls' game. So we had to go to the girls' soccer game before us, and we had to stay there for the first half, and we would watch, and, and you know, and it was kind of like, you know... Just to be honest, you know, and again, this is coming from my very self-centered, egotistical young man, but I'm just being honest with you, it was a snooze fest, all right? We were like, are you kidding me? Come on. There's literally nothing happening. What is going on? I'm watching girls basketball right now. I'm watching girls. And, and listen, <laughs> I know I was wrong. I know I, it is absolutely wrong. And, to, and I, I tell you, I look at it completely different today. But I'm just being honest with you, my sinful state and my selfishness, that I didn't care about the race before me. I didn't care about the game before me. I was, had, I, I was literally forced to have to go there uh, to care about it. And so what does it mean to honor? What does it mean to really honor the race before you? Why was the author of Hebrews so concerned about those who went before him? Listen to this passage again. Hebrews chapter 12, we looked at it this week. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off 
everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of the faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. This very passage describes exactly what's happening, but immediately, not just what's happening now, it actually began with what was happening prior to us running our race. But if you're like me, you kind of skip to that part, and you skip to, where's my race? What's, what, God, what do you got in front of me? Lord, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for some advice about how can I run my race? I'm not too concerned about the race that comes before. So how can we honor the race before us, before our race? I want to look at two things this morning. And the first one is this. Give God the glory because it's his story. I'm hoping because it rhymes, you might remember it, okay? Uh, but just in case, say it with me. Give God the glory because it's his story. See, I, I look at the very first part of this passage, Hebrews 12. This is the part we skip. Therefore, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Now, I get it. I get it. It's really easy to go past because I'm focused, and he even said, I mean, Shane, he said in the passage, focus on your race. You talked about it last week. You said stay in your lane. I'm staying in my lane. That's what I'm doing. I'm focused on my race. But I'm saying the therefore... The reason you can focus on your race, the whole reason that you can do that is because there was a race that went before you. In fact, the context of this passage builds from that race in Hebrews chapter 11. Look at what it says in Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. It goes all the way back to the beginning. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he was dead. This is long before anything ever happened. By faith, Enoch was taken from his life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. Before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. Didn't even hear of it, never even heard of it. And by faith, he commended the world and because and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. So we could even say, by faith, the race that went before us, right here at West End Assembly of God, by faith, a pastor by the name of Dr. Bob Roden receive the call from 12 people right here in Richmond, Virginia. And he answered that call. By faith, he came and, and, and he and Joan came and started this little church together. And by faith, John Hirschman was invited, even though he was his brother-in-law. Okay, that takes some faith, right? Okay. Uh, by faith, John Hirschman, John and Helen answered the call. 
And instead of going on and pursuing his studies to be a PhD and, and, and he, as from, from Princeton and on that, uh, the teaching and the path that he was on, by faith he moved to Richmond and joined now what is a growing congregation. By faith, Bill and Linda Martin came together and, and joined now what was an established congregation and began to meet the needs and put his gifts out on the table and became this amazing teacher that all of us loved and, and now go forward. By faith, uh, Bob Laughlin received the call to come and bring now what was a growing church, the creative arts, and reclaim the arts for Christ in Richmond, Virginia. And now on every Richmonder's mind at Christmas time is how are they going to get a ticket to glorious Christmas nights? See, in our culture, we hear the stories that go before us about the people. Because in our culture, we live in, uh, really honestly, a culture that, that puts heroes on pedestals, don't they? In fact, we always need somebody to follow. Who's the latest celebrity? How can I follow them? How can I get check out what they're saying? We don't even care. Do you know, if you're a celebrity, you can publish a book, and it doesn't matter if you know what you're talking about. People will buy it. Did you know that? Because we need celebrities to follow. Do you know that if I start wearing something, no one cares? I don't know if you knew that or not, but if I'm wearing it on the live stream, nobody goes, wow, did you see what Shane's wearing? I mean, they might go, wow, did you see what Shane's wearing? More like and more in a negative way, I get that. But no, no, nobody cares. But let me tell you, a professional basketball player, a professional football player, they start wearing something, everybody cares. They can even start their own shoe line, and I'll buy the shoe just because their name's on it. In fact, I'll pay hundreds of dollars if their name is on it. And if they really become famous, then I'll pay even more than that. And if they really become a legacy, then even though somebody wore them in some stinky shoe that existed, if it was an Air Jordan in a certain year, it's worth like $1,000. And if it didn't come out of the box and you kept it in the box, oh my gosh, it'll go for auction for who knows how much. Because we worship legends, don't we? And see, part of the reason I think that that happens in my life anyway, and as I, I thought about this, like, God, why do, why do I do that? What is it about me that does that? I, I think there's an aspect of our culture that's, if I'm honest, has truly impacted me, that, that I love following a hero. I want a hero so bad. In fact, worse than that, I'll be completely honest with you, I, I kind of dream of being one of those heroes. If you're completely honest... I mean, when I played sports as a kid, I didn't dream about Shane Schlesman. Like, I, I dreamed about being one of the greats, you know? I, when I, I wore their number, I wore their jersey, I, I, I chose my number growing up based on who I worshipped, who I, who I thought was great, and who I, who I thought was amazing, and not just those who were before me. I remember even in my own high school, like, getting to the point where I could wear someone's number on the varsity team that I watched, because I went to a, one of those Christian uh, schools that you had the elementary all the way through the high school, so when I was in elementary school, I was going to the varsity games, and I was watching them, and I was dreaming about being those kids, and, and then later, when I got to be on the varsity squad, I was like, oh, I want to wear this person's number, like it was an honor, it was, I want to, because if we're really honest, if we're really honest, we dream about great things for ourselves. Nobody dreams to do something lame. Nobody dreams about like, hey, I hope I grow up one day and live a boring life. Uh, nobody dreams like, hey, I just hope I get along in life. You dream about the amazing things. You dream about the heroes. And, and the passage in Hebrews is talking about this beautiful thing. Therefore, he says, therefore, since... The race before you happened because of the faith that went before you. You have a race to run today because of the race that was run before you. 
And we think because of our culture, we think that that is a focus and what we need to do is lift up the heroes that have gone before us and nobody could ever be them and nobody could ever fill those shoes because we put all of the focus on the person. And the point of Hebrews 11 was never, the point of Hebrews 11 was never the heroes in the hall of faith. The point of Hebrews 11 was the faith in the God of heroes. It's not. He's not saying run the race before that they ran. He's saying run your own race, but he's saying honor the race before you because they ran it so you can run it. But let's not be mistaken and think that somehow the hall of faith, the great Hebrews 11, the great heroes of the faith, that the story of God is about the heroes. The story of God is about the faith of the heroes. That changes everything. That changes everything. Now, I can run a race that is unique to me because I don't need to fill anybody's shoes, but I have the opportunity to run a race. And in our context at West End Assembly of God, you have an opportunity as, as the next generation coming up, you have the opportunity to run a race because someone already started it. Because someone already built on it. Somebody already put themselves down. But the point of the story isn't them. The point of the story is God's glory. That's the point. And no matter how many times those leaders point us back to God, no matter how many times those heroes say, no, it was all God, we shake our heads and go, oh, no, 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 you were the hero. Because we, we want them to be the hero. We need them to be the hero. And when a hero falls, we shake our head and say, boy, that hero. They weren't a hero. They were a zero. They, didn't, they weren't a hero after all. Look at them. They're liars. They're hypocrites. They're, they're people. They, look at them. They, they said one thing and did another. You mean they were human? You, you mean they were normal people? Wow, I'm shocked. Aren't you shocked that somebody said one thing and then couldn't live up to it? That is shocking. No, certainly not of you, Pastor, because I thought you were a man of God. Uh, certainly not you, a uh, great, great leader of the faith, because I thought you, certainly, if anybody could hold out, it was you. Certainly, the people that we put in front of our kids and the per we put in front of our, they can't fall. And the reason they can't fall is because we've made it about them. And we've missed the point of the story. The point of the story has never been about them. The point of the story that God is asking you and I to step in today, the race that he wants to run, isn't about how capable you are in fulfilling the dream that is set before you. It is about how capable God is in working miracles through anybody who has faith. Amen. You can clap. Come on. Be with me on this because let me tell you, this is huge. If we can get this as a church, can you imagine we won't celebrate heroes anymore as putting them up on a pedestal or putting them up somewhere? I'm not setting you up. Pastor, do you have some announcement? Do you have something you want to tell us this morning? You're not, not living up to our standard? I'm telling you, it's not about me. That's my message this morning. Because I can promise you, this standard is above all of us. In fact, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No one, not you, not the heroes of our past, no one. Because it wasn't about their glory. It was about God's story. Here's the second point I want you to get. 
So when you want the glory, you hinder God's story. Because here's the reality, right? The reality is, this is real. Say, the struggle is real. Okay? The struggle is real. Because in reality, we don't just worship heroes. We want to be one. And this is what hinders the story of God being told over and over and over again. That was the point of Hebrews chapter 11, that he would say, let me tell you the story of God. He wasn't telling you the story of Abraham. He was telling you the story of God who took Abraham and a wife who was barren, and he multiplied his offspring more numerous than the stars in the sky because God can multiply anything that he touches if you'll just have faith. But we want to step in and be the next Abraham. Who's going to be the next Abraham? Who's going to be the next one? Who's going to be the next hero in the story? That's what we want. That's what we worship. And that's what we miss. In fact, Jesus said it. Recorded in multiple Gospels, Jesus comes along and says this in Mark chapter 6. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives, and in his own home. And here's what it says about Jesus. Mark records this. He could not do any miracles. How many? Any miracles. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. Because that was about personal faith. That was about those people and that moment. That was about, yeah, he could do some things in a moment, but corporately across his own hometown, in a big way, in any kind of movement, he couldn't get it going. He was amazed, Mark said. He was amazed at the lack of faith. But let me, let me just show you this. This faith was produced from this honor. And the lack of this honor, the lack of this honor, can I do that? The lack of this honor, can I do that or not? Can I, can I, can I, can I, can I, can I, yeah, can I? Can I, please? Oh, this is going to be good. The lack of this honor. Whew, okay. The lack of this honor is the lack of this faith. And so this is our story. And I know we don't want to admit it. Uh, we don't want to admit it, but it's true. This is our story. When you say, how does this line up, Pastor? How are you saying this is our story? Well, it's our story because we don't understand why we should honor people. We think that we should honor the authority over us so that we can come and kiss the ring of the authority over us. We think that honoring the authority over us is about the authority over us. We think that honoring the authority that God has placed over us is about how good they are. And the better they are, the more we honor them. The bigger the church they build, the more we honor them. Because if I were the pastor who doubled and tripled, if I were the pastor who built this church to 10,000 people in Richmond, Virginia, let me tell you, I'd be getting calls and, and people asking me to write books and, and you guys would bring me honor and people would show up and, and I'd have more followers and I'd have people looking at me because of something that I did because we think that honor is about what I produce And Jesus said, in the context of what I'm about to explain, Jesus said this pretty simply, lack of honor, lack of faith. Lack of honor equals lack of faith. Now, remember what Jesus was doing. 
Jesus was amazed at their lack of faith. But then it goes on and he talks about this idea that, that somehow the leaders of the day were the ones who didn't put honor. And they were the ones, the religious leaders, weren't the religious leaders always the one questioning Jesus? Why was that? I wonder if one of the reasons was the same reason why you and I would do it. If you're in charge and somebody else is showing up and everyone who you're leading is no longer listening to you and now listening to them, why wouldn't you also question them? Because it's about our leadership. It's not about the story. If they were really listening to the story... They'd be like the wise men who traveled from other countries and other parts of the world who were following, who weren't even necessarily believing in Jesus, but saw it and read it at face value and began to follow a star because they believed a prophecy if they were really listening. Did the religious leaders also know the prophecy? They knew all of them. They knew hundreds and hundreds of prophecies of Jesus, the Messiah, who would come. They knew what town he would come from. They knew where he would come from, what line he would be in. They knew that he would be in the line of David. They preached it. They taught it. But somehow they missed it. Because they thought honor was somehow a challenge to their leadership. I'm glad some young people are here with me today because I want to talk to our young leaders today because I want to make it really clear to you. I want to make it really clear that you don't need to honor me. You need to honor God. But let's be clear that honoring the leaders that have gone before you is not about the leaders before you. It is about God's story and hearing and understanding where you fit in the story of God coming after them. And if you learn honor if you learn honor, if we can get this as a church, but I'm talking to the next generation because I have hope, because if we could learn honor, if we could learn this, maybe we could see some miracles like we've never seen before. In fact, maybe the reason why the church isn't seeing the miracles that Jesus was laying out, maybe it's a lot to do with the fact that we don't know how to honor I want to talk to the next generation partly also, too, because this is just a part. You know, how many people have heard some bad things about the millennials? It's okay. You can raise your hand even though they're sitting here. It's all right. They know. They've heard them, too, you know, okay? They understand it, all right? I get it, right, millennials? Aren't you a little tired of being talked about? Every, listen, you're no exception. Every single generation was talked about when they were young because the highlight reel of when you were young is usually about you and usually about mistakes and usually about how it gets presented. And let me just tell you that I'm with you in that boat. I was talked about exactly the same way as Generation X. As we were coming up after the boomers, we were saying, it's our time, right, Keith? We were saying, it's our time. This is our time. This is what we want. And so then we said, hey, you guys don't get it. And then we did worse than that. We told the leaders before us that they don't get it and they need us because it's about, it was about them and now it's about us. We think the new chapter is about handing off the baton to the next generation so that we can make exactly the same mistake and make it about you. And that's not what we want. In fact, we've, it's the enemy I believe, has made and heightened this issue to all times high like never before. And millennials, let me just say, it's not your fault. Everybody who's not a millennial right now, if you're not a millennial, I want you to say this out loud. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. Now, I know you said, Pastor, you shouldn't say that to them because you're just enabling them. You're just enabling them, Pastor, okay? Uh, I, I get it, I get it, okay? But here's the deal. A, a, a great book by, the, by Tim Elmore was written, and in this book, uh, Tim lays out some, he did a study, uh, and he did this study, and he asked 
the millennial generation, he asked them, and I'm going to walk over to the screen. Can you walk with me? He asked them to describe words. He asked them to describe things that about that was said about them of the generation before them. And they said, the word that we're looking for starts with the letter E. So they said, exceptional. I don't know why I wrote exception. That's my bad, okay? They said exceptional. They said, what else did they say? Extraordinary. They said enthusiastic. But that wasn't the E word that came up in description, right? The E word was entitled. Aren't you sick and tired of hearing the E word? Aren't you sick and tired, millennials, of hearing how entitled you are? Well, here's the good news is, all of the generations have been entitled. Because all of us have thought that when we grow up, we're going to do it better. But here's what happened. I have to apologize to you as a Gen Xer. Here's what happened. Boomers, you should apologize to me and I'll apologize to the millennials. But let me just tell you that you may, back when I was a kid, let me tell you what a pickup truck was for. It was about hauling about 18 soccer players to the next field. And we, you know what seat belts were for? That was about messing with your sister or brother in the back and hitting them with the belt, okay? Now, but we, we have taken safety to whole new levels and it's not your fault. We didn't even let you go out and play without a helmet on, okay? You look like the state puff man going down sledding. Uh, my parents didn't even know where I was until it got dark. I'm sorry, mom and dad. That's not, a, that's not, that's not, that's, uh, that's just the truth, okay? <laughs> you didn't know. <laughs> we didn't have cell phones back then. We didn't have texting. And, and they said, be back by dark. And then we didn't get back. Or they said, be back by a certain time. And they didn't. They just had to sit and worry. They couldn't text me anything. Wouldn't that be cool? Some of you are like, amen. I'd like to go back to that day. Mom can't text you when she's worried about it. That'd be a pretty cool, okay? But... We just made this, and we've taken it to new heights. And let me tell you what happens in the church. Here's what happens that's so sad. The worst part about this impact that we're experiencing in our culture is this, that millennials tend, when they come into the church, they tend to way overestimate what God can do in the short run with them. And then they way underestimate what God can do in the long run. Here's how it looks. Man, it's going to be my turn. I'm going to do great things. I'm going to build a church. I'm going to start a church. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this ministry. I'm going to build the biggest youth ministry or the biggest whatever, the biggest kids ministry. I'm going to be amazing. I'm going to be Pastor Lisa on steroids. I'm just going to be incredible. I'm going to be so amazing. And then all of a sudden, you start working. And years later, and you start to go get the education, you realize, man, well, they're not letting me in this school. I don't know what their problem is. Uh, and, the, and then they realize, oh, this is really hard, and this costs a lot, and, and all these things, and they get discouraged. Why wouldn't they get discouraged? Because we've told them from day one, we believe in you. You can do anything you put your mind to, but it's not true, because then there's a whole bunch of work to do. And we've left out the work part. See, my parents had a really good strategy. Make my life horrible, and I'll want to leave when I'm 18. That's, that's a good strategy, but we, now we have a different strategy. Now we're like, I'm just teasing, I'm just teasing, but we, we have a different strategy. We tell you, you can do anything. We're going to make it all perfect for you. We're going to take away every barrier. I'm going to give you everything I never had. That's my life dream is a man. I just want to give my children everything I've never had in life. I'm such a good parent. Look how I'm providing for them. I'm so good. And then we start posting all your accomplishments. Like they're the most amazing thing in the world. And we put the picture up and we put the thing up. We say, oh, it's the most amazing thing in the world. And it's not your fault. It's not your fault. We did this to you. And every generation has handed the next generation a challenge to deal with. This is yours. Stop taking it as an insult and start realizing that this is my mountain to climb. This is my race to run. Let me tell you something about this generation. I, I wrote some things down in my Bible. Because <laughs> when I was your age, I, 
I didn't get this. And I respect you so much. I'm so blown away by you. I'm so inspired by you. (laughs) You are the most cause-driven, mission-minded generation in modern history. When I was growing up, I didn't even think about the poor. I didn't even think about the traffic. I didn't even know what was happening around the world. And you guys, you bring mission to everything that you do, and you bring authenticity. You're not trying to be somebody else you, you're not. You say, if it's not real, I'm not interested. And you step up, and you, you claim something, and you claim not just for you. You claim it for a future and for a that you never had and never imagined. You see justice around the world and you declare justice of God in kingdoms and in countries that it doesn't exist. You see injustices and you say God doesn't want that and you bring the kingdom to it and you bring the church to it and you make us old people have to do something about it. You are the generation who are taking the kingdom of God and making kingdom justice around the world. And you are not the future of the church. You are the church. I have such inspiration that comes from you. I know we get on your case. I I know we ride you hard. But you know what? We're trying to make up for our own mistakes because we realize we blew it. We realize that we made everything so easy that you would expect it all just to work out for you. And then we go, oh, shoot. Now, Now nothing's working out. And we fall apart. And we say to you, oh, my gosh, little girl, little boy. Oh, I don't want this for you. And you say, what are you talking about? It's all falling apart. And then we think the world is coming apart. And we can't do it. And we drop out of the race and so we have terms we have terms that we've given you uh, that that people who follow their hearts and say I, i'm a i'm an activist and we call you slacktivist we call you a slacktivist and and the, the titles earn because because you start a cause and then you realize how hard it is and then you stop it and start another one you're like uh now now what are you doing these oh now i'm now i'm, now I'm all about feeding the homeless i'm going to solve that problem that turned out to be really difficult. So now I'm solving this problem and that turned out to be really hard. Apparently you can need a whole degree or something. I don't know what you got. You need a whole like doctorate degree or something to be that. I don't know. I don't need that. I can't do that. I can never pay for that. I can never do that. Uh, nobody told me any of this. So, so I move on to the next cause and the next cause and the next cause. And I just want to take on everything because I'm striving to fill a hole and striving to be a hero that I can never be because you've made it about the hero instead of the faith that the hero should have had and not faith in you. I believe in you, but that's not even the point. The point is I believe in God more than you. And if you don't step up, I know that God will use someone else to step up. You're not going to live this perfectly. I know you're going to fall over and over and over again, but you know what you're going to be? You're going to be a picture of the pillar of amazing grace that Jesus offers over and over and over again and he will take beauty he will take your ashes and he will make them beautiful before the whole world in my failures in my weaknesses I will be made strong because the faith of my story is not in me as the hero the faith in my story as in God who will be the one who brings the kingdom through you that's what I celebrate I want to be a church that launches the next generation. I don't want to wait. I don't want to wait till I'm ready to, to pass it off. I want to, I'm, I'm waiting for you to be ready. It doesn't matter when I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm wanting you to be ready. But here's what's needed. God said it. He said, there's no honor. There's no faith. But unless you learn to come under those and honor them, you will not get what God has for you. If you try to step out and surpass it and try to do it your own way, it will not bring the miracles to Richmond, Virginia that is needed. It might bring a big church. It might bring a big gathering. But I can tell you it won't bring a movement of the kingdom of heaven like that could be seen if you would just honor those who went before you. Not because of them, but because you bring glory and honor to God. That's 
what's needed for the next generation. In fact, when we give honor to God, Mark chapter 6, then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the 12 to him. He began to send them out two by two and gave them authority. The pathway to authority comes through the doorway of honor. It comes through the doorway of honoring God and those who he's placed over you. It's not about the authority that's in front of you. It's about the authority that God desires to give you. I tell you, I want to take a moment and honor those who've gone before me. Mom and dad, it starts with you. Mom, you didn't, <laughs> you didn't know what to do. You were a young mom. You were left alone with two kids who didn't have fathers. And you were on a path to find God. And, and Dad, you, you stepped up. You already had two boys of your own, and, and you stepped up, and you took on a daughter and a son. And said, you'll grow up with a dad. You only knew the love that was given you, so you did your best, but, but I honor you because you were there as a mom and dad who then placed your faith in Christ. I honor people that you put before me by taking us to a church with Dr. E. Robert Jordan, the chief. I, I honor Pastor Jordan, who's now in heaven. I want to bring you honor, Pastor Jordan. I want you to know that you turned my life around. I want to bring my youth pastor honor, Pastor Brian Wahlberg, for chasing me down, Pastor Vince Degler for chasing me down, for coming after me, making visits to my house and coming to games. And I didn't even care. I didn't invite them. I didn't want them to be there because if they were there, then I had to have conversation. I didn't know what I was going to say. I didn't want to have to turn down yet another, uh, keep rejecting the same guy over and over. It was heartbreaking. But I want to bring honor to my youth pastors who poured into me, not because they saw potential, but because they obeyed Jesus. Because some of them, to be honest with you, were thinking, I don't think anything going to be happening with this one. I want to bring honor to the youth leaders in my life who spent time with me, who poured into my life. And, and some of them aren't even serving God today. But, but let me tell you, they pointed me in the direction. We think that we can't honor somebody because they're not serving him? How hypocritical of us. You can't bring honor to people who aren't serving the Lord anymore. Let me tell you, in that moment, they were serving the Lord. And they made a difference in your life. And because of that difference, it wasn't about them. It was about the difference that God can do with anyone who have faith in a moment and he can do it in your life. I want to bring honor to the pastors at West End Assembly of God who poured into my life. Pastor Marlon who poured into my wife and Pastor Hirschman who didn't even know me but he knew of me. One of my peers, Pastor Bob, or Pastor Robbie Roden who began to invite me into serving. I want to give honor to the serving teams at Exile and the young adult ministry who served with me, who let me practice my gifts at West End Assembly of God. I want to give honor to those who went before me, like Pastor Bill Martin, who sat at a table with me and turned me down for a job. <laughs> He turned me down, and then he, Pastor Bill, sat at a table at a Starbucks in downtown Richmond at VCU, where I was currently ministering. And he showed me why it was the best news he could ever give me, was to turn me down for that job, because there was a better one God had for me. It turned out to be right here. 
I want to give honor. Not because it's about them, but because it's about the glory and the story of God. And because he can do it again. Because he's not done. And no matter who you are or what generation you're a part of right now, he wants to tell his story, not just once, not just in Hebrews 11. He wants to tell it again and again and again. He wants to proclaim the truth of the gospel through your life. And every time you fail, that is the gospel. If you'll stand up and say, I have failed, and because of the grace of God, he has forgiven me. But they won't know that unless you admit your failing in front of them and say, this is my failing. This is where I've fallen. Let me tell you the grace of God. And we tell the gospel story over and over and over again. And we will build great things. Oh, no, 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 no. God will build great things. He will do it again because we step up and not allow it to be about us and not allow it to be about one generation or another generation, but to allow it to be the generations that God calls to serve him for his glory and he will do it again. Do you believe that? Would you stand with us right now and make that your prayer right now? Oh God, would you would you do it again in our lives? Would you would you take our faith and multiply it across this city and multiply it across our neighbors, not because of us, but because of you, oh God. That is the story that we will tell in your name, Jesus. Do it again. Thank you, God. I see you move. You move the mountain. still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness your veil in your hands this is my confidence you never fail your promise still stands great is your faithfulness your faithfulness I'm still in your hands and this is my confidence you never failed me Lord you never failed I've seen you move you move the mountain and I believe I see you do it again you made a way where there was no way and I believe I see you do it again I've seen you move you move the mountains and I I see you do it again. You made a way where there was no way. And I believe I see you do it again. Your promise.
still stands Great is your faithfulness Your faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my confidence You never failed me God, you've never failed us yet. Your story has been told for thousands and thousands of years. God, may it never stop with us. Lord, we surrender right now that we know that in order for that to happen, we cannot allow it to be about us. So teach us, God. Teach us to make it about you. And God, raise up people as you already have from this church. I pray for a whole nother generation. God, I pray for the grace to be able to speak it to generations to come. That we would watch them. And more than that, God, this wouldn't be a handoff, that it would be a launching of ministry of the church of today. And God, may we partner together between generations once and for all and stop making it about our generation and start making it about the generations of the kingdom of heaven. So God, I, I pray for all the churches in Richmond, Virginia. I pray for every denomination represented. I pray for every single denominational leader over our commonwealth and over our eastern seaboard and over our country. I pray, Lord, that you would release in generations to come people who would make the glory of God be the story of my life. Let us right here do our part at West End Assembly of God to tell your story. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. All God's people said, amen, amen. You thank God for everything he's doing. <laughs> We're so glad you came out and did a flash worship with us. Uh, we're so glad for those of you who joined us online. Come on back. Pray against the snow for next Sunday, okay? Uh, enjoy it. Enjoy it this week. But I pray for a clean roads and those things to come on back because I want to talk to you about what it looks like, what it looks like for the generation that's gone before to launch a generation. I want to talk about what God believes ought to happen right here in our church and every church. And so I'm going to share some more things in my heart in week three of Living Legacy. God bless you.